Good morning. So, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone, this is Ryan McAllister from Lightborn joining me for a session on creative empowerment and sustainability. If we can go to our deck, please. Thank you. Um, so why don't you take a minute and uh, introduce yourself. Hey everybody, thank you for having me here. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. My name is Ryan McAllister. I'm a creative director at a motion graphics studio, production studio based in Cincinnati, Ohio called Lightborn. Um, sort of my, my quick, my background is I started in this industry about 16 years ago as a designer and animator. I was a senior designer and animator for about almost 10 years and then became a creative director. And my main focus has been doing live events and that sort of kind of to what JT and Laura were talking about earlier. It's the way that I think about it is what I do is create content for whatever surface you want to throw at me. And sometimes it's not even an actual surface. So it could be a virtual surface. Um, but mostly my focus has been doing sort of like tours, live events, TV shows, broad, screen content for broadcast productions and things like that. Here's an example of some of that work. Yeah. So, you know, the stuff that we're all familiar with, the grind of what we do, is kind of what we're going to talk about this morning. Yeah, I looked at all these photos and uh, a bit of the Lightborn reel, and my first question was, uh, how much sleep did you get? <laughs> <laughs> None, because I am a goblin person that thrives in the <laughs> darkness. So I want to start our discussion with this basic idea. Moving from lighting into video, two things happened. I suddenly was known by every producer in the room. As a lighting person, I could stay pretty invisible. But as soon as I was on the video controls, everyone had an opinion, and they found someone to tell them where the controls were and suddenly I was talking to people and trying to field all their changes. So with that, I also realized I was staying up a lot more hours overnight because as a lighting person, I could only work in the room. Video goes with me on my laptop and all the hours exist for corrections to be made and work to be done. How did that happen? Yeah, I, took, I mean, man, the question that haunts me, um, and, and I think, I mean, there are practical reasons, like you just said, like we, especially if you're working on like a show, um, you only have time during the night to like, you know, you're there with the LD and you have to figure the stuff out uh, on the product that you're working with uh, overnight to make sure that it looks as good as it possibly can. And, you, but I think from a more like existential, I guess, place, people, we, we, we I've noticed that we can back ourselves into a situation where ma magic happens overnight and all of a sudden people come back in the next day and they're like, oh, you've solved, you miraculously solved my problem, but they don't acknowledge the miraculous side of it. They just acknowledge the, you solved my problem overnight side and uh, I have enough, you know, a combination of caffeine and whatever other substances to keep me upright to celebrate that victory with those people. But I think, you know, it, the the question that lies underneath the question right is like uh yeah <laughs> why why do people think that we can just magically hit press a button and you know there's the i i'm sure that everybody in this room from both the technology side and the creative side has been in a situation where the a, a non-creative or technical person is wondering why you can't just make the thing that they want you to make why can't you just do, you, you already did 19 other versions of it, why can't you just do the 20th one right now? And of course, we're all as an industry figuring out how to do that in a more competent way, but is that really a practical or like reasonable position to be put into, I guess is the question. Right, it's, and, and then we make a point about this later. The, the magic of it, I think, eliminates learning opportunities because the labor doesn't involve uh, a physical event. So one thing I would often do with producers, especially when I was negotiating a budget, is remind them, if I gave you wood, hammer, and nails, you could build me a table. If I gave you a computer, could you build me the same table in 3D? 
because, you know, there's something relational that has to be tangible for the people we're engaging with so that they understand that it is labor. Yeah, and I think that that's like our, that goes back to some kind of like deep evolutionary issue that I don't know that we're gonna solve today about how the intangible nature of like design and art specifically, and then e even more so like the technology side of things, um, that, that it doesn't, like you said, if you put hammer and nails and, and wood in a pile, like a pallet of wood in front of somebody, their brain can like see it and say, okay, but if I, you know, if I'm like, this is gonna take, like, it, I still have to build the thing in 3D yeah. or whatever. Uh, for some reason, that reasonable part of their brain shuts down, and they're like, okay, but isn't, aren't you just like sitting there pressing buttons? So. And and it's a good analogy you can use quite well, right? Because there's also a different in the table you bought from IKEA and the right. table you bought from a fine furniture maker. That's a good point. So we can talk about those same things because we're, we've all been in situation where something's described to us that we need and we either can go to a stock site or now plug into mid-journey and get most of the way there. But we also want to be able to have those conversations about the craft of making excellent pixels. And there's a time you want to go to a fine furniture maker. And then the rest of the time we just do this. Right. <laughs> oh, this chart. I think we... I think we tend to try and be the unicorn quite too often, which is why we get devalued. Always, and that's, I mean, and, and you and I have talked about this previously, like there's a, there's a certain level of like um, addiction to pain. Like I, it, I think everybody in this room probably suffers from this on some level. I, I know that I'm like severely uh, saddled with the desire to over deliver no matter what I do. Um, because I can't, I, I'm not sleeping anyway, but if I was, I wouldn't be able to sleep if it wasn't like the coolest or best possible solution to the thing that I was thinking of. And the producers that I work with and the money people, uh, I'm, they're endlessly barking at me to like figure this problem out. So I think that, yeah, but I, I think that there's like a thing about wanting to the problem, I guess, that this discussion is trying to get at is like, how do we solve, like, what is the sustainable way to go right. about that? Because there's, I don't know that I'm gonna, without, you know, like thousands of dollars and hours of therapy, figure out how to like stop my need to make excellent things. So I think it turns into more of a, how do we communicate with our clients about what they're actually getting from us and why it is, what it takes to achieve a certain level of excellence. Moving on with these thoughts. Oh, wrong place. Something that comes up against as a leader of a team, and we already have this perspective that we want to do our best work. And sometimes that best work happens in late hours, in those brainstorm moments when a light bulb goes off. Uh, coming up, uh, working crews in, in New York City, working around unions a lot. I'm in Local One myself. I was really grateful for the idea. It got very expensive to work between midnight and eight in the morning. Um, that doesn't always exist for us, there, so there isn't that boundary. So I started to see as in the video world, there were wonderful things that could happen when you immersed yourself in the challenge and just let it wash over and take over your mind all the hours. So I want to have that work ethic and I want to encourage others to have that work ethic. But then we misrepresent ourselves to our clients. Right. So we need to somehow have some boundaries about what reasonable hours really look like. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it. so the way that I try to think about it, and, and my situation is unique because I'm like in the middle, well, our studio is in Cincinnati, Ohio. So the kind of people that work with us, they're extremely talented, but they tend to be the people that like came out here or went to New York and worked for a few years. And they were like, I want to own a house. I want to start a family. So I'm balancing um, people that are like me and are addicted to doing good work, but also like have other priorities in their lives as well. And I think that there's a, to, to sort of like drill down on this, a way that I think about it is applying, because I'm a designer by trade, like that's like my, the, and I got into animation. And I think like applying a certain level of design thinking to our creative work, because you're right, there's like, 
I tend to rely on like the magic that happens where, or like inspiration, right? There's a difference between uh, having a, uh, a very high quality product and like an inspired piece of content at the end of the day. And most people don't, like the, they, they'll feel something if they see the inspired piece of content, but they will also be very happy with the high quality design piece of content. And what I mean by that is like, when you, when you use the principles of design, you're developing a skill set, kind of like a carpenter, mm -hmm. where you know that there are, I don't want to use the word tricks or gags, but like there are systems, there are techniques that are always going to reliably work to create something within a reasonable amount of time. And you're not sitting there sort of like beating your head against the desk, trying to like wait for inspiration to hit you. So a thing that we do, like that I try to do and encourage my guys and uh, ladies at Lightborn to do is to ha be very flexible in the way that they work because we do work in a deadline-based industry where that's not gonna change. So there is, crunch time is inevitable, but taking the time to explore and play and be in, in sort of like absorb what is going on around you mm -hmm. and let that sort of feed the subconscious creative, but also always be honing the knife of design or what technique, I guess, is a better word to use. So that when, because you can't rely on inspiration all the time. Like sometimes you just have to get the thing done. And if you have honed that knife, you can still cut something that looks pretty awesome, but it might not be like the most inspired solution that you've ever come up with. And I think that that's like a that's good That's like way. the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the effort gets you 80% of the work. When you have an established workflow and a process that you can support, you can get close to say a request or a design challenge with pretty low effort. Yeah. It's that last 20% that takes 80% of your effort. And that's, and I think, so it's interesting because I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you think about this. Like, I think that that translates really well among creative or, you know, people in this industry when we're talking to our own teams, but the magic trick is like, how do you communicate that to an end client? Yeah. Like, here's what you're, you're gonna look at, uh, I'm gonna show you in progress stuff that I, that has been made at a reasonable clip and, but it's not gonna maybe, like, it might not translate cleanly to yeah. what they think that they're about to see. Yeah. Um, but to, to bring us around more to this idea about the reasonable hours and our work culture, I also want to look at this question. Um, we love that feeling when we can meet the client demand, right? Yeah. Or pull the, the magic rabbit out of the hat and save the day. That creates a culture that celebrates this heroic effort and causes us problems later because of unreasonable expectations. Yeah. And How do you handle that with your team? Well, so it's hard. It, it is difficult. <laughs> um, I, I mean, what we've been trying to do recently is uh, have every like we don't have we try not to have specialists anymore or people because that's I feel like that's a good way to get certain individuals locked into being those heroic people that save the day constantly and they'd never sleep, you know, and again. This is all caveated by the fact that there are some of us out there that have a thing in our brain that's wired to just love this, these challenges. But I think in order for things to be healthy, what I'm trying to do is like cycle people in and out of projects or design, set up our internal way we approach projects so that I can move almost like shifts of people through things or spread, not have stuff be so siloed mm -hmm. in, into I individual camps and have be, you know, have a constant sense of communication. I mean, one of the cool things about working in a studio where we have like 10 full-time animators is that everybody is always communicating and feeding off of each other and, and leaning on each other. And I think that that can be also applied to like when we bring in freelancers and, and people that other teams that we're working with, because I don't know that that, yeah, that we, th this is not a sustainable model. Um, so we're, we're all, I, have, I'm, I don't claim to have figured it out, but I'm moving towards trying to with uh, a few different experiments, I guess. This issue we're talking about is pervasive across all digital creative and digital labor communities. There are memes like this all over the internet, um, pretty easy to find. That's, I think, my favorite in the upper right. 
Um, I'm sure we've all felt like that. I'm, I'm also pretty fond of this, uh, you know, six window meme on the bottom, especially anything related to 3D modeling, content creation, all of them end with somebody face down or hand punching through a computer. Um, but I think we also really like this challenge and this fight. We're tuned for it. We just need to find a, a good way to have a uh, relationship with um, employment around it. Yeah, and it's interesting because you don't want to like, it's hard to be in a situation where you, I, like for me, I keep thinking, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna educate this client, this new client yeah. that I have. I'm going to teach them how this process works. And it, uh, it, that is such a fine line to walk and to not come off sounding either arrogant or like your uh, uh, professor trying to like, you know, because these people are also very smart and no, they know what they're doing. They just, there's this this nut that we need to crack of like, how do we convince them that like the effort, the, like the amount of effort that is going into this stuff. And I think it's it depends on who you're working for too, right? Like I, I've had many clients and like show directors and people that do understand how much work goes into it. it doesn't change the fact that we, you know, inevitably something like this will happen and you'll be slamming your head against the desk trying to get the thing done. But um, I think, yeah, like we're talking about, how do you, like cultivating a daily sort of like um, environment where it can accommodate for those moment, those pinch moments, Yeah. right? Yeah, which begs the question, can project-based work ever be done with sensible hours? And I think this is a meme we're all really familiar with to that point. Yeah, I, I mean, so, the, and, and I'm curious, I, I'd be curious to talk to every, uh, the other people in this room after this about like what their thoughts on this are because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. I know what it's like to be in the chair making the thing and I know what it's like being the one who's talking to the client explaining the thing that has been made. And th this, mo this is like the model that if I was a guy by myself, this this meme is this is how I would work probably. Like, and it's not great, uh, it, because I thrive on um, being in like a foxhole and under siege. Yeah. But that's where it goes back to this. Like, I've been thinking about like, okay, if you apply, um, I think there's like a misattributed quote to. I, I don't think it was Ernest Hemingway who said this, but there's something along the lines of like, write drunk, edit sober. <laughs> and I think that like there's like the passion side of it. It goes back to like us relying on heroic feats of magic. That if you are if you can get rid of this big red section on this chart and actually be like incrementally like just working chiseling away at the problem, you it sets you up way up way better to in that zero hour be able to like then try to apply some sort of magic to it and finish it off. But um, that that. And it also helps every other member of the team that you're working with, that not just your studio, all the other teams, like, you know, I, there's been so many projects that I've worked on that like at the last minute, there we're like delivering stuff and the lighting designer hasn't had a chance to pre with any of the content that we've made or we're, you know, waiting around and we get a bunch of changes at the last minute because the LD and the creative director of the show have been in a bunker together doing their own thing and haven't been communicating with us. So, and, and I'm curious what you think about this. I think a lot of this stuff can be solved with just like, br not brutal, but like honest communication amongst all the players on a project. Well, you made a really good point about like, if this was your individual work, yeah, you can do this creative process. It, it's fine, you can put yourself through that. And I think, did you go through a theater program in school of any kind, or did you? Not, not like in, in, in college. I was definitely a theater kid, like in high school. So there's something about a, the theatrical education that I think doesn't always uh, occur in like if you're going through an animation program or a design program, which is this collaborative creative work. So, and, and I think it's a really important point for all of us to consider. Like I did theater through college. Um, everybody is working toward the same goal for an 8 p.m. on a Thursday night. And that collaboration just gets instilled in your system. You are thinking 12 steps ahead. You are looking at your teammates at where they're lagging behind or ahead and supporting each other. And it becomes this nonverbal process of reaching a shared creative goal. Now, 
you have a clear plan, you have a script, you have rehearsal process, you have a lot of tools that we don't necessarily get in our work environment, uh, including even today, you know, the, this room is busy, we only have so much time to prepare an event like this. So we try and create structure, and with structure, I really like having a clear outline of an approach because I know when shit goes sideways, there was an intent. And yeah. so you can respond to change because there is a way to say, my course is over here, I just need to follow this new path that just evolved, but course correct to, to get back on this trajectory. There is an end goal. If it's on a piece of paper, if it's you know through leadership, um, the screens producer role, any kind of video leadership, we are in a collaborative, creative endeavor working with people who may not necessarily come from that school of thought about this work. Yeah. Um, I know for me, to motivate uh, creating my version of the screens producer role was to try and build better communication practice across all the different disciplines that consider themselves the video department that maybe aren't even really communicating with each other well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and there's like a lot of creative opportunities that get like left on the table because you're not communicating clearly. Like there's yeah. endless shows that I've worked on that y you you see the show when it's actually up and running and, and all you see are the missed opportunities. That wouldn't have been like an, a Herculean effort to get together and pull it off. It's just that everybody silos apart and isn't communicating clearly. Right. And I love I love the analogy of a script because that's sort of another thing that we've been trying to do more at our studio is like have a clear, I mean, part of it is like a cover your ass kind of thing, like yeah. have a clear calendar and like list of deliverables going into a project, knowing that it's gonna get blown out of the water within like a few days, but like at least that document exists out there and it's a malleable document, like you were saying, but it, helps, it's like a scaffolding that everybody can kind of like ha start dressing the, the entire project on. And, and even though the scaffolding is, is um, parametric, <laughs> yeah, it'll change, uh, it, it's scalable, but it can, it le we can all be on the same page. And that kind of like goes into that sort of like the educating the client side of things. I think there's a little bit of, uh, the people in, in the room that are creatives, are probably familiar with doing um, what I would refer to as creative jujitsu with clients and trying to convince them that an idea that you had is actually an idea they had, or if they have a bad idea, you turn it into a good idea, but let them let their ego uh, walk away unbruised. Um, and I think that there's there's also sort of like a practical version of that on yeah. these projects where we can not not come off as preachy or something like that, but like still guide, provide uh, a, a framework for <laughs> how a project is gonna go down and it might appeal to a client that thinks about things and more in terms of like spreadsheets and, and money, for example. A yeah. thought, it just occurred to me. A thought or um, maybe a union. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Well, you know, I you you mentioned that you've been you're a part of a union, you've been part of unions, and I, I've had interesting experiences, right? Because I've been in like that zero hour need to get a thing done, and then the venue I'm in shuts down, and I'm like, somebody might as well kill me right now. Like, I can't believe that I'm I I'm the one who's stuck holding the bag here, and it'd be great if I could also just shut it down and not have that like level of anxiety that I'm gonna take with me or like pack my entire uh, on-site crew up and go to like some van or some hotel room to try and keep yeah. working because things shut down. And and I think what's great, you know, it's interesting. It might not be the perfect solution to, uh, and I'm curious to see what you think about this, but like some kind of like, um, what is what would be interesting about it is a, the collective sort of bargaining or, um, uh, uh, getting everybody on a uniform set of sort of like theories and ideas and, and uh, like approaches to how we conduct ourselves in these shows and on these projects. Um, it's a it's a tricky one to to think about. Please excuse my Google Drive, which is misbehaving. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, it, it's something I think about a lot 
because I want to understand the best way we can do the best of what we do and have those creative, immersive moments, whatever time of the day they occur. But I can also clearly describe the number of times I've been pulled away from that gut-wrenching moment of trying to solve a problem because the room has to go dark because of the unions that are there. Not my union necessarily, but... And going away and sleeping and walking to work the next day with the absolute perfect solution yeah. that might have taken two or three hours in that exhausted state had I pushed myself through the night before. It, it's, it's so hard to walk away when you're like pencils down when, when it's time to stop. But rest is so critical to what we do as well. Yeah. And I think that that's like, there's a lot of science that backs that up. Uh, and that, I mean, like, I think a, a lot of people in this room probably have anecdotally, like, where you, the one time that you don't listen to a podcast when you're in the shower or something while you're working on a project and it's just you're sitting there in the quiet moment and the, the, the solution sort of, like, locks in place, the Rubik's Cube makes sense, is all one color on all sides. And I, I totally agree. And having, and, and again, I keep using my, I'll use myself as an example. I need I would benefit from somebody enforcing that yeah. on me yeah. as because I, you know, it's really easy for me to do it for other people to, in, to make sure that other people are, are handling it. And, but then like, how can I expect to have every, you know, and then the other thing that could potentially be a benefit of a union as I'm thinking about it right now, or some kind of consortium or something would be the uh, the looming subtext of all of this, which is, is somebody just gonna swoop in and do this job if I try to mandate some reasonable uh, like accountability from my client? Is, is somebody who doesn't demand that just gonna like slide in there and, and do this nowhere near as well as I would do it or you would do it, but uh, for the amount of money that they're asking for in the amount of time that they're asking for? And there's some protection. So the risk of doing this well, with best practices for the team members that we care for, right. is pricing ourselves out of work. In some cases, yeah. And, and maybe this, if, if there was sort of like a collective sort of set of rules, you know, because I, I'm not, I don't claim to be an expert on this stuff at all, but it seems that the way that that stuff works is that they, they, you can't scab in on those kind of things, or you are ostracized, or the client gets ostracized, uh, and and maybe that, maybe we need somebody to impose <laughs> this sort of that kind of uh, scaffolding on us. Yeah, I, you drop this into the. <laughs> I don't know why this made me think <laughs> we need a union, but I know this kind of stuff burns hours <laughs> that could be more effectively spent. But we move on. I do want to get some time for uh, questions in the room. Um, let's focus on this question to wrap up, because I think this is where we're headed. How do we align as a community? And we could talk about framework a little bit, but how do we align as a community on sustainable work practice? You bring up a really good point. Is it Client side driven? Is it community driven when it comes down to agreeing to what those best work practices are and who is going to be responsible for maintaining them in production? Yeah. And, you know, I think the hope is that, I, like, I got to think that most, most of our clients want something that is amazing. And they've, you know, we've sort of gotten them used to the fact that we can do that in a maybe perhaps a, a somewhat unsustainable way. So, I think that like, you know, the, in, I've been in this industry long enough that I've seen the pendulum swing a few different ways where they're like, you know what, I'm sick of paying for this stuff. And you have a whole season full of like garbage content out there. And then it swings back and everybody's like, I'm sorry, I wanna, <laughs> let's do this the right way. And if we can kind of like, n you know, uh, attenuate that and, and get some kind of, uh, uh, like put some rails on the way that we approach this stuff collectively. I don't claim to know what the answer to that is, but uh, I would love to have, I'd love to have an in-depth conversation, perhaps with some Mezcal or Scotch with any of you about how we can figure this out. Um, Be free later today? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's still, maybe it's, I, 
I'm fr- it's it's later in my mind right now because <laughs> I'm from the East Coast. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious what, what what your thoughts on this are as well. Um, well, I I had this kind of addendum slide that went with it because I think this is where I struggle. It's I want I want to create this alignment. It's part of the motivation for framework to assist that to exist is to assist us in coming up with this alignment and what we want our best practices to be around work. Can we achieve that in a coll- collaborative production environment? That that's where I get stuck sometimes. It's it's. I mean, obviously we do it. There, I've worked on Broadway. You have a schedule. You have a structure. If you have a pile of money, you can change that schedule as many times as you want. Um, but there, there is something about the pressure cooker. I think we thrive in um, the people who come into this work who grow up in that pressure cooker, and it feeds their ability to achieve. Yeah. Um, these are the harder con- and more nuanced conversations of our community culture and and what direction we can propel the community into for our best health. Yeah. And yeah. I don't have the answers. Yeah. <laughs> Do any of you have the answers? <laughs> um, but, I, but I'm excited to try, and um, I'm going to buy us back a little bit of time for starting late, and I would love to open the room to questions and understand how people feel about these issues. So uh, we're going to have a couple of PAs in the room with mics. And if you're watching online and you want to post questions in chat, uh, we want to continue this discussion with you. There's a hand. (laughs) Hi, uh, I'm Soren. And I have uh, many opinions on all these topics, which I won't get into, but I do want to Thank you for talking it out. And I would encourage Framework as an organization and as a community to keep asking these questions and keep pushing on this topic because it's, it's a real problem. Part of it is because we're human and that part won't go away. But I think it's a really, really important topic. So thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, absolutely. Soren West, one of our framework founders, by the way. Thank you. There's another hand. Hi, I'm Chet. Um, So in your own work, one of the things I cut my teeth mostly in theater when I was growing up, because I'm totally done growing up now and totally an adult. Um, (laughs) So the theater 10 out of 12 schedule, one of the things that is kind of a the unspoken rule for a lot of us is you don't make decisions after the evening break because that at that point you're too tired you've been there in the room for too long and any choice you make is going to be a mistake and you'll spend more time undoing it throughout the rest of the next morning is that something that you've also come across in your work do you want to answer that first? Or do you... I'm chewing on it a little bit. <laughs> so let me, let me follow that up just to understand. So uh, no big changes, you're saying, in the evening or after a break? After the last break in the evening, so you've yeah. done your dinner break, you're basically at the last 15 minute, and so you're in the last like 90 minutes or so of the session day. A lot of us make the conscious choice not to try and make a big decision because that decision is probably wrong. It's more of a That's frustration and tired. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I love that. There's uh, what's the there's something about like you you want to hope that you don't have like a traffic judge uh, uh, before they've eaten lunch or something like that, like because they're gonna be more uh, angry with you for no reason. Well, but, I I immediately thought of um, my husband who in, at some point in his career in a corporate job. They had a, uh, if you drank at lunch, don't come back rule. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the same Smart. thing because your brain late in the day, let's face it, not, not too sharp. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, it, it, I think that like in the day-to-day practice of making things, I think that's a great axiom to apply to what we're doing. I, it, 
the, the, the big question that I think we're wrestling with is like in that 11th hour when you're delivering the thing, it, it, it's hard to, it, I think the trick is making, applying those rules so that you have the bandwidth when you need it to actually like dive in and accomplish the thing. And perhaps there's even a way to do that uh, apply those rules to being in in delivery of uh, a project at a production rehearsal or something like that and saying hey I know that I'm gonna be here grinding all night on and like executing but I don't want to have to be coming up with new ideas if I haven't slept in 24 hours so putting like a, a creative sort of bulwark up against that is a, is a really cool idea I like that because I'm thinking about also what happens like for your team you're sent away with a list of changes that you're working on overnight. There's probably an operations team in a room somewhere queuing with the existing assets that yeah. might be wrong by morning. And where's the communication kind of monitoring these change orders that came in late that by morning, maybe your talent or your creative wakes up and goes, that was a terrible idea. Or actually, I want to change it again, because that's going to happen too. So. Some of those questions, I think, are leading ultimately to the one challenge I see, which is we have to have a pathway for creative exploration. We have to have sensible work environments. Yes. Can we get a mic over here, please? Oh, he's got one. Oh, he's got it. Hi, I'm Pablo. Um, I don't have any answers. <laughs> uh, but I do think that questions are really important. Um, I wonder how much of this is up to the next generation um, and how much of this is our responsibility now as many of us mentors, educators, to help the next generation find that balance and those boundaries. I yeah. um, can tell you my strategy <laughs> was to not fully give up on live production but move more into permanent install where you are beholden to a general contractor schedule and a, a whole set of um, other external factors that that force that pacing, right? And and that you can't do the last night all your work right before the deadline kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I I think you know what I've noticed, um, particularly in my teaching role, but, but also in sort of mentoring other, uh, you know, younger people coming up as assistants or, you know, collaborators, is that I have a lot of faith in the next generation. I think that they're, they have a, a better sense of themselves and, and this need for balance in their life. So I think, uh, yeah, um, but we got to find them <laughs> and we got to bring them in. And we particularly got to find more people of color yes, because please. when I look yeah. at this room, I'm embarrassed. That's, that's my few thoughts. In the back. Um, hi, uh, my name is Tony. Um, I'm a researcher. I'm I'm new to this field, um, but actually I'm concerned about uh, we mentioned the labor, but I try to avoid this word because it sounds not good for me. I would tend to use workers <laughs> instead, it sounds better. Actually, I have a question to ask compared with the traditional way of live event productions or even green screen production. Do we have more bargaining power? Um, can we? You know, sometimes if the client asks something is impossible to do, can we do something like, hey, um, provide another solution or something like that? How do you see this shift of bargaining power in, in this field? Thank you. Yeah, bargaining power is an interesting idea. Obviously, as a union member, I am beholden to a very large bargaining system um, that I in my roles tended to exist outside of. I was never working uh, with IATSE for their minimum rates because I came to a production with a set of skills that I could earn more for, honestly. But there was always that structure that there was an entity making sure I had health insurance, 
and retirement and vacation money being put away somewhere, even at the most minimum job in that environment. Bargaining power for us, I think, is tricky because I, what I see in production often is we're still learning how to communicate across these different silos of video and people who do the different pieces of it. So we have work to do locally per production to improve the communication so that we can, as an entity of like-minded, skilled professionals, do the work of presenting ourselves under some kind of banner to say, these are our production practices, our labor practices, our earning practices. Yeah, I mean, I, there's nothing, I don't, I, I, like I said, I don't have a lot of experience being a part of a union, um, just working with them. And I think that like the collective sort of might of uh, uh, their best practices sort of s sets a tone, I guess. And I think that there maybe is a way to do that without being a union per se, but um, the, the trap I think that we fall into sometimes is uh, we, we're also very good at finding solutions to problems. Like that's the, one of our, um, you know, secret sauces that we have at our disposal. So if you need, you know, if you go into a project, you know you have to have maximum editability down to the last minute, you will figure out a way to solve that problem for you. We, you know, maybe to the detriment of ourselves. And I think that that's, that's the thing, that's the secret, like, you know, it shouldn't be a, uh, or, It'd be great if we could find a way to all work together so that we're not competing on who can pull the coolest rabbit out of whose hat, I guess. And we all sort of collectively are building these magical experiences, um, you know, within reason. I think we can sneak one more question in. Hi there, my name is Michael. <clears throat> so many of the things you brought up today are interesting and I wanna ask about so many of them, but I'm gonna limit myself to two questions. And the first one is, Laura, um, how many of the people who work with your husband come to work after lunch? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think a lot of these questions about unions, collective bargaining, really referred to a model that e exists in the 20th century. It's location-based. There's a building that is under the jurisdiction of a union. It could be corporation-based. That's becoming harder and harder, though we see that even Starbucks is fighting with it. But in our world, or your world, because actually my projects mostly now are in the built environment, so I've got the construction crews as well to thank for the time to go home. However, it doesn't mean the people making the media don't then have to stay up all night, right? So how do we, how do we implement that kind of thinking, that kind of collective bargaining, that kind of discipline in what is really a virtual world? You know, if you're not part of the theatrical crew, the electricians, the carpenters, uh, you know, you still are going to have to stay up all night. You've said that. And if you don't work for one corporation, you are going to be, you're going to put yourself at risk of pricing yourself out of projects. Which, by the way, at some point in your career, maybe that's something you do. Yeah. But I guess really what I'm trying to get at is, how do we think about all these things you're talking about, which I think are extremely important, and how do we kind of implement them or think about how to achieve them in what is essentially an environment and a work environment that is no longer bound by time and space? Because that's what it comes down to. So I I'm guessing you will not have the answer right away, but I think this is a way we have to think about it. I and maybe you have some thoughts. I'm glad you're here to ask the question. I don't have a clue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. I love that. Uh, take on it because it's it's it is like sort of what's swirling around all this like there's a little bit of an anachronistic kind of uh, flavor to the conversation right so what I, I what I just keep coming back to and a lot of the answers to a lot of these questions is there I feel like communication is the key and not not being um, prioritizing uh, 
clean and clear communication between each ourselves, the members of our various teams, the industry that we work in, our clients. And because that's the ways that we can communicate, are chain, are the, the avenues with which we can collaborate are so much more vast now than they used to be. And maybe like, you know, the, 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 the union conversation doesn't make sense. It has more of a 20th century flavor to it, but there is a way that we can all, um, the, uh, the tools that we have available now to, to continue to communicate. And then I kind of want to piggyback on uh, a, a question that was asked earlier, a comment from earlier that like, there is the younger generation um, definitely has more of a sense of their own time and has more of a, and, and they're like extremely talented people. And, and I think that it is, uh, as, as, you know, I can only speak for myself, I guess, as I sort of like age into more of this leadership position, one of the roles that I can take on more of is to be more of that communicator. And, and like my job becomes more about like, not only captaining a creative ship, but also like communicating the way that the work gets done and how you applying that hone tool part of my brain to solving other problems than just like, what's the cool visual ice cream I could make for this pop star that's gonna go on a screen behind them. But like, how can I apply that the same, uh, problem solving techniques to uh, figuring out this problem. And I think collaboration, like I'm not gonna do it by myself, but I think when we all start communicating with each other and talking and getting in spaces like this, that's where like there, there are moments of insight and inspiration that happen as we all sort of like spark up against each other. And then we can like use those sparks to like maybe kindle some kind of like flame that we can wield together. I think that's the perfect place to end. Um, so you have an assignment for the next two days. Let's, uh, let's talk about these issues and uh, find some solutions for the future. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.